morning. It's so good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. Beautiful day outside. Probably a lot of temptations to do something else. I'm glad you did not yield and you came to church. Thank you so much for being here. If you are a first time guest, we certainly welcome you with open hearts and open arms. It's so good to see you. We're glad you made your way to Aviano Baptist today. We always look forward to being here on Sunday morning seeing new people and you fulfill our desires. So thank you so much for being here. I hope you got a visitor card when you came in. Uh, fill that out, uh, tear it off the flyer you have, drop it in the offering plate later, and take the flyer home so you can know about all the things we do here at Aviano Baptist. We're going through a, a time of transition now. Things are getting different here at our church. Uh, we're in, uh, continuing fer feverishly the search for a new building for us to move into where we have more room in our sanctuary, more room to grow. Uh, we're going to be looking at another building tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock over toward Portanone. There's one right over here around the corner we're looking at, so we're going to try to make a decision on a new building. In the meantime, we're doing our best to accommodate everyone who comes here in this building uh, for the next few months. To that end, there are two new rooms you need to know about. Outside that door, go through the next door across the hall. On the left, there's what we're now calling the nursing slash cry room. <laughs> if you have babies that need to nurse or are crying, you want to take them out of the sanctuary, move right over there. There's a, a big... Uh, TV in there that's transmitting every, that's showing everything we're doing in here so you don't miss any part of the service. You can go over there and be in comfort and quiet. Uh, in the meantime, downstairs now, in the past you went downstairs and turned right to go to our satellite sanctuary. Don't do that anymore. You turn left and then right. <laughs> and there's a whole new room down there prepared with a 65-inch flat screen in there that shows everything we're doing up here. Some very comfortable chairs. We hope you won't be tempted to fall asleep down there. But... Um, the satellite sanctuary is down there now for any overflow from here, for any, anything that's, that's happening here. If you, you just you want to be more comfortable, you want to have freedom, maybe get up and walk around while I'm preaching, you can go down to the satellite sanctuary. And uh, You regular tenders, if you see us here on a Sunday morning uh, getting too crowded here, it would be really nice if you would slip off downstairs to the satellite and leave the seats in here for newcomers, people coming to uh, visit our church. So those are two new things you need to know about and we'll certainly keep you posted as we move ahead with other things here. With an eye on our need for a new building, whatever we wind up renting, and we're now, we know we're forced to rent, we don't have the privilege of buying, even if we had the money, uh, the building's going to require some modifications. There are no 
uh, empty Baptist church buildings waiting around here, uh, sitting around here waiting for us to move into them. We're going to have to take something prepared to be a warehouse or who knows what and turn it into a church. So that's going to cost money. And to that end, we have an account on the GoFundMe website. You can go there and donate money to um, help us meet those needs. Uh, there's about uh, three or $4,000 already flowed into it, and we'll need more. We have a goal to try and reach somewhere around $20,000 because we'll be needing to put up partitions, move in sounding and, you know, sound and video and all this stuff to do church the way we're accustomed to doing. So we ask you to keep an eye on that and pray about it and do whatever the Lord leads you to do. Uh, we've been asking a lot of you financially here uh, since November when we started buying firewood for the cold people, poor people in Moldova. I'm aware of that and this building funds, some on top of that. But in addition to that, we still have our annual global mission offering of the, of the International Baptist Convention. You were given envelopes last week, and I hope you'll pray about that and uh, put something in there, a few bucks, you know, skip a pizza sometime this week and put that in an, off, in an envelope and give it to the global mission offering. And on the wall outside there, as you leave the building, there's a, a flyer out there on the wall, a poster that shows you where all that money goes. And uh, it, it's all very, very important, and we want to do our best to support the global mission offering. Uh, that's how we deal with world missions through our church while we're dealing with our local missions here through what we do right here. The publicity arrived this past week for Interlochen 2015. Now, if you're, you're new in town, you don't know what Interlochen is. Every year for over 50 years, the old European Baptist Convention and since 2004, the International Baptist Convention has been having a summer Bible conference in a place called Interlochen, Switzerland. I've been telling people ever since I've been here, I would go to this conference if it was held out in the middle of a desert somewhere because the spiritual content is so rich and so good, I wouldn't miss it. The fact that it happens to be held in one of the most beautiful places on earth doesn't hurt. Interlocking is fantastic. Now, interlocking is expensive. Switzerland is expensive. Everything costs more up there than it does anywhere else. Uh, the dates this year are July 4 through 9. Because of the expense, they're not going to have it next year. For the first time in decades, we're not going to have a, a summer Bible conference next year because the expenses are keeping people from going. I want you not to miss interlocking. One time in your life, I want you to go. So you can begin saving now, start planning your leave, you military people, uh, civilian employees. July 4 through 9, interlocking Switzerland, uh, annual Bible conference. We're going to try to find somewhere to have it that's more affordable for more people, but uh, we're one of the richest congregations in the convention, so we should have no problems. But you just need to make some plans uh, to go to interlocking with us and have a great time. Of more immediate interest, here are two things you need to know. On Saturday night, March 28, before you go to bed, spring your clocks ahead one hour. Do not fail. If you do, you're going to miss church the next day or get here. I don't know. What, what you, yeah, you come late if you don't do this right. Uh, the actual official time is 2 o'clock a.m. on Sunday morning, March 29. We don't really want you to wake up at 2 o'clock. We want you in church alive, alert, awake. So do the clock before you go to bed on the night of March 28. Set it ahead one hour, and then you'll wake up at the right time, be at church at the right time. Everything will be just wonderful. For Easter Sunday, April 5th, here is the final program. There will be no amendments to this once I announce it, okay? That's interesting because we've been batting it around here for weeks. We will meet here in this church building at 0830. Those of you who want to be part of a sunrise, S-O-N-R-I-S-E service, will be in here at 830 Easter Sunday morning. We'll have about 30 to 40 minutes, hopefully 30 minutes here, just to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Then we'll fall out downstairs into the fellowship hall for an hour of food and fellowship we'll, uh, till about, uh, about 10, 15. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, 10, 15. Then we'll come back up here at 10.30 for a one-hour worship service. Then we'll move from here to Area D for our potluck picnic, Easter egg hunt, time of fellowship and food again over at Area D. So that's the schedule. It will be on the website. It will be in bulletins starting next week. You're going to have lots of chances to look at it, but we want you to make plans. Uh, sunrise service is a, it's a good thing. We usually do it up on the mountain, but last year we got rained out, so we're not going to do it on the mountain this year. We'll do it right here. And it'll be a short 30-minute thing. 
Then we'll go into food fellowship and uh, just a good time together here worshiping the Lord. So we'd like to have you come and spend that time with us. Uh, ladies, be thinking about what is your best home-cooked dish that you can make enough for your family and two or three other people. That's what we ask for our potlucks, make enough for your family and two or three other people. And yes, You're talking about the plastic East rigs you can pop apart and put back together and they'll stay together. You want the ones that stay? Okay. So there you are. Chances to donate and participate and help us out with Easter Sunday. Um, if you ladies just don't have any idea what you should prepare for the Baptist Church potluck, you can talk to your preacher. He has lots of good ideas. <laughs> and I'll be very happy to give you the benefit of my wisdom. All right. So there you have it. Uh, right now, I want you to join me in prayer as we to prepare our hearts for the rest of our worship service. We want to just get in touch with the Lord, make sure he's here among us. So let's pray together, would you please? Our Father, our Lord, our God, our Savior, our Sustainer, what a joy it is to be able to look toward heaven and call the great God of this universe, Father. This happened not because we deserved anything from you. We certainly didn't deserve this privilege, but you loved us, you desired us, you sacrifice for us. You've saved us. You have made us your children. And Father, we thank you from the very depths of our hearts that you've given us that special joy, that special status of being children of the living God. As we gather here this morning, Lord, more than anything else, we want you to come and be among us, to minister to our needs as you know them to be. We have ideas, but we don't know everything. You are all wise. So we ask you, Lord, to look into our hearts, see what we need, and meet that need for us today as we gather here to worship, to sing, to give, to pray together, uh, to study your word together. We want you, Lord, to meet us here and touch us in a special way. We certainly pray that as we leave the building at the end of the service, we will be improved, we'll be better Christians than we were when we came through the door. Lord, if anyone came through this door today who does not yet know Jesus as Lord and Savior, may this be that day of decision for them. We want to see people coming into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We do not want his death on the cross to have been in vain in the lives of any people whom we know. So we pray, Lord, that you have your way in those people's lives again today as well and save them if they're here today before they leave this building. We pray for that. Lord, we pray that around the world today, wherever your people are gathered to worship you in spirit and in truth, you will be there. You'll get great honor and great glory for yourself. Souls will be saved all over this world. Communities will be changed. Churches will be strengthened. Lord, there will be people today who will be severely persecuted because of their love of Jesus Christ. We pray you will give them strength. May their faith not fold. May they stand strong. May they bear their witness regardless of what it costs them. And Lord, through their faithfulness, may some, perhaps even their persecutors, see the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives and be one to saving faith in him. We pray for that. We just thank you, Lord, for all you've done in our lives, all you are doing, all you're going to do here today, Lord. We thank you. We just ask you, Lord, to see our needs, meet them. Help us, Lord, do nothing here today that doesn't please you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, stand up, shake hands with the people around you, make everybody feel welcome at Aviano Baptist Church today, and then we'll be right back here in a moment.
moment together. Pastor's got another announcement. The main part of the work that converted the room downstairs into a satellite sanctuary was done this week by Thomas Boadu sitting right over there. Stand up, Thomas. He put in about two and a half days of good hard work painting. It, it, you would have to see the room to understand what he has done just this week. Uh, back somewhere in the past, one of our youth ministers told the teenagers, it's your room, do whatever you want to with it. And boy, they did. That was the most garish decorating job you've ever seen anywhere in a church building in your life, probably. It took more than two coats of paint, but Thomas has covered it all up and the room looks wonderful. To reward him, we're going to be taking a love offering at the close of this service. Richard, there by the door, will have a bucket or a basket or something in his hand. Please reward Thomas for the work he did because he worked hard. It was a tough job. He did a great thing. Right now, in order to give a little biblical emphasis to our praise worship, we want to share with you from God's word, Psalm 67, 3 through 7. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase, God. Our own God shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. You want God to bless you? Praise God, and he'll do something good for you. Stand with us as we worship together.
teach a new song right now. It's a little chorus that I wrote, and it's, uh, it just talks about, you know, we, we've got to come broken before the Lord. So I'll sing it through and then just join in as you get the tune. Broken vows, broken promises. Lord, forgive you my sin.
Right now, children's church can be dismissed to go upstairs, and today we can let two groups go up, uh, let's, age three through age nine. You can leave and go up to children's church right now. There are two sets of volunteers up there, age three through age nine. While they're leaving, let me say that after church, uh, our music minister and his wife, Adele and I, are going to be going down to the restaurant Dorth down here just for the railroad track on the right, the old Hotel Duimo. That's where we're going for lunch. So if you'd like to join us for a time of fellowship and getting to know each other better, please feel free to just come down there with us. And we always sit around and eat well and have a good time together after church. We, we go somewhere every Sunday after church. and It's a great time to just get to know each other better. So feel free to come with us if you wish to do so. Open your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 3. We're entering into this time, moving down toward Easter, Palm Sunday, then Good Friday and Easter, all those marvelous things. A time when we as Christians celebrate the most important chain of events that ever happened in all the history of the world since the dawn of creation. Nothing has ever happened to compare with what Jesus Christ did for us that first Easter season. I'm going to spend three Sundays talking about the crucifixion. I want you to understand it perhaps better than you ever have in the past, how it applies to you. Then on the fifth Sunday of this month, Brother Ike's going to preach, and then on Easter Sunday we'll take on the resurrection, of course. But I want you to get to know the crucifixion, to understand it. I'm going to give you a heads up right now. In the third sermon in this series, there's going to be some very graphic description of the physical suffering of the Lord Jesus. Come prepared. <laughs> it's graphic. Today, we're going to look at what I'm calling simply creating a cause for the crucifixion. We're going to read Genesis 3 through 10 just in a moment. In the meantime, just to set the stage, help you to understand. How many of you have seen the movie Fantastic Mr. Fox? We only got three intellectuals in the whole church, I swear. We need to work on our intellectual level, don't we? I haven't seen it, but I have read about it, and I like what I read, and I'm going to use it just to help you set the stage here, understand. It's an animated comedy film based on a book by the same title by a guy named Roald Dahl, D-A-H-L. Uh, it's a story about a crafty Mr. Fox. He has a, a wife named Felicity. Crafty Mr. Fox is noted for being able to raid the farmers around, steal their chickens and other fowl, this kind of thing. And Felicity accompanies him as a loyal wife would. He goes around raiding farms and stealing stuff and until one night they get captured in a cage, caught in the act. And Felicity lets Mr. Fox know for the first time that she is pregnant. She doesn't want their little kids to be raised in captivity she makes him promise, when we escape from here, she knows we're foxy, we're going to get out of here. I want you to promise me you're going to give up this life of crime. Get an honorable job, do something honest, so we can raise our children without fear of being captured. And Mr. Fox promises. Sure enough, they escape, and he goes on to become a reporter, a news reporter. And they build themselves a really nice home under the bowl of a big tree. They dig a den and build a, a home, and they have their children, and... Things go along for two years human time, according to the story, 12 years fox time. But in just 12 fox years, Mr. Fox slips back. He forgets his promises. He goes back to raiding again, stealing from the farmers. After a while, the farmers get tired of his pilfering and they come searching for the foxes. They find their home. They begin to dig. They just pull a raid on Mr. Fox's and Felicity's home. They're huddled down in the basement, down in the bottom of their den, and she says, you told me just 12 fox years ago you'd give up this life of crime. You lied to me. Why did you lie? He says, because I'm a wild animal. His wife counters, but you're also a husband and a father. Mr. Fox says, I'm just trying to tell you the truth about myself. 
There is something in that story about all of us. We have a wild animal nature, a fallen nature inherited from Adam and Eve. It started in the passage we're going to look at this morning. It led to the Lord Jesus Christ having to be crucified. You and I make all kinds of promises. What an appropriate course to end our song service with. Broken promises, broken vows. We do these things before the Lord all the time and to one another too often. You and I are the reason there had to be a crucifixion. We're going to look at this just a moment. Follow please as I read Genesis 3, 1 through 10. You can follow either in your own Bible or on the screen as you choose. I do hope you carry a Bible. You have one. You use it well. I hope it shows the evidence of being used and abused. Genesis 3, 1 through 10. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Father, please add your blessings to the preaching of your word and the reading of your word. And please add your power to what we're going to be doing here the next few minutes. Let this be a time, Lord, when hearts can be touched, lives changed. You know what we need to do to become more like Jesus. You know what you want out of us. So help us, Lord, become those people that please you most. And may this sermon this morning touch all our hearts and lives in a special way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If we were to be sitting around on the, my front porch or something talking about why the crucifixion and ask all of you why you think it, it happened, we'd all have different answers, maybe some of them would be very similar, but we'd all have different answers as to why it had to happen. I think in the, today's passage we find the real reason why it had to happen. I want you to share this with me. As we go through our text, I'm going to begin with the first four verse, five verses and simply talk to you for a moment about the guile of the devil. You can expect to hear several words beginning with G as we go through the outline this morning. The guile of the devil. The text says the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had created. He was cunning. He was filled with guile. He was an opponent of Almighty God. Once upon a time, he was the highest archangel in heaven. So filled with pride, he sought to assume, to usurp the, the throne of Almighty God, and he was cast out of heaven. Not, he and all the angelic beings that followed him cast down to earth. He has hated God and everything God is trying to do from that day to this. He opposes everything God is trying to do. And because he is a supernatural being, not as powerful as God, not as powerful as Jesus Christ, but more powerful than any human being, he's a supernatural being and he is filled with guile. And when he made this visit into the Garden of Eden, when there were only two humans on the planet, he came bearing all that guile with him. And he unfolded that guile in the presence of Eve, the mother of all beings. And he used it to trick her. He first of all, began to cause her to doubt. Has God indeed said you shall not eat? Did God really say that? Now listen to me. I would like to tell you that the human race has made some very positive steps. We have evolved in a very positive direction since the Garden of Eden. But the truth of the matter is, if we've done anything at all, we have devolved. The whole theory of evolution falls flat on its face when you look at the human race that started out back there and has got just worse throughout the centuries of our being. We are still having people who look in the word of God, they'll read exactly the words that are set on the pages of the Holy Bible and they'll say, did God really say that? Listen, we have not improved at all. We're just like Adam and Eve. We inherited that nature. We're no different from them. 
The woman answered very honestly. She knew God's word. He said, we can eat of everything except that one tree over there. And the, the serpent, Satan, in the form of a snake, with all his guile, you will not surely die. Oh, that may be what it says on the pages of the Bible, but that's not really what God said. That's not what's going to happen. I, I, I've been talking to a, a man who's terminally ill with cancer, unsaved by his own admission. I've been trying to tell him, dude, <laughs> I don't know how long you got and you don't know and the doctors don't know. They may say this, that, but nobody knows, but you need to make arrangements because here's what the Bible says to people who die, about, people who die without Jesus all. And he shrugs it off. And he will not make that decision to trust Jesus. Terminally ill. Going to die soon from what his doctors say. People are still challenging I own the pages of the Bible. Okay, you read it in the Bible. Who knows who wrote that? Who knows who put that in there? Uh, you, what, what were they thinking? What were they trying to do? They had some motive up there. So you can't pay attention to that stuff. Listen to me. If it's on the pages of this book, we had better pay attention. This book has been assaulted, attacked, attempts to destroy it down through the centuries. It's the best-selling book in all of the history of, of literature, and it is God's rock-solid, unchanging word. Everything is, that's prophesied in here is going to happen. And when people die without Christ, they're going to go to hell. God said it. That's what, what happens. You will not surely die. So he's got her convincing, convinced already that God either didn't say it or he didn't mean it. <laughs> I, I, I like that. If God says it, he means it, folks. And he meant it when he told Adam and Eve, you don't touch that fruit. If you do, you're going to die. Well, then the Satan goes on and says something else. You know, he, he appeals to her pride. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, a chance to be just as wise as God, huh? Wow, wouldn't everybody like to have, be in on that action? Yeah, human pride. We, you know, it was pride that got uh, Lucifer kicked out of heaven and made him Satan. And it's pride to keep many people from turning to, to Christ in faith and being saved. We, we just don't, we just cannot give up our own personal pride. We'd love to be like God. And many, many people are being God in their own lives. You talk to them about idolatry. I don't worship any idols. Anymore. Well, yeah, but you do worship yourself. You, you, you've taken control of your life. You won't give it up. You're, you're in control of everything. You won't surrender. You're your own God. You've put yourself on a pedestal and you're worshiping yourself. Things haven't changed. The guile of the devil. It's described very well in 1 John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that fruit on that forbidden tree looks really good. The lust of the eyes, that's beautiful stuff. It's good for food and it looks so good. And the pride of life, you'll become just like God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, you can take 1 John 2.16 and maybe all of us should do this. Get it in big, bold, black letters. Put it on a refrigerator, on the dashboard of our car, everywhere where you see it all the time. Because here's a simple fact of life. Every sin in your life can be nailed to one of those three things. And it helps you to know, to analyze your own life. To know pride of, uh, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Which one is it that makes me live in this style of sin? It's there. I want to tell you that the guile of the devil is a constant factor in the world. He has not changed. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven, just like they have not changed, Satan has not changed. He is still filled with guile. He is still using that guile. He is still tricking people. He is still the great deceiver of the human race, the great enemy of God, the great enemy of man, and one who deceives us all the time. His guile has not changed. He is still sharp. He's smart. He's dangerous, and he's out to get us. And so many people are making it easy for him. The next thing we see in our text I call simply the gullibility of man. The gullibility of man. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's lust of the flesh. That it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. A tree desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. She took of his fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate gullible. Knowing what God has said, 
but with some little in Inherent, innate desire to somehow break out of the mold that God has set for us and do something my own way, we become gullible. Satan shows us how to do things our way instead of God's way. We say, oh, that will work just fine, and we jump right into it. The gullibility of man has not changed since the Garden of Eden. It is a constant factor in the human story. We're still susceptible to the deceit of the devil because he always comes around with something that he knows we want. Now in verse 7, it says, The eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Right away, they realized they've made a serious mistake. They made a serious mistake. And right away, they, like human beings today, begin to try to cover their own sin. <laughs> and it won't work. I'd like you to notice, by the way, that the first sin that was ever recognized among the human race was not violating God's only command. It was being naked. That's important because it's getting to be warm weather and it won't be long till people around Aviano will start trying to get as naked as they can and still be legal in public. <laughs> Nakedness was the first sin that man ever recognized, not the fact he violated God's command. They didn't have any clothes on. They began to do their own thing to try and cover themselves. Now, some people, some skeptics, some God deniers or whatever they are, like to make God responsible for what happened here. They like to say he did it on purpose. No, he didn't do it on purpose. He created man and woman in his own image. He gave them a free will with the intent that they would exercise that free will always to honor and glorify him in everything. Adam and Eve chose to do something different. They chose to honor and glorify themselves. That is the Pro, the key to the human problem to this very day. We still like to honor and glorify ourselves instead of God. They took that free will that God had given them and used it for just exactly the opposite thing. I cannot tell you how many people over the years I've talked to and they said, well, you know, I do want to be a Christian one day, but first of all, I just want to do my own thing. What are they saying? I want to have as much time as I can to do things my way, and once I think I'm getting close to the end, then maybe I'll, I'll get saved and become a Christian. People just want to do things their own way. And, and, and it keeps so many people out of the kingdom of God, out of uh, the, the, the family of God, and out of, out of heaven. And it's just one of those horrible things that happens to people. James 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. It was not God that made Adam and Eve sin. It is not God who will make you and I sin. What, does he permit it? Sure, he gave us a free will and cut us loose. You know, that, that's one of the signs of the sovereignty of Almighty God. He lets us free to exercise our will any way we want to because he knows that in the end, he will make us pay if we don't do the right things with our free will. He is totally sovereign. The fact he cuts us loose just shows how totally sovereign that he is. He doesn't have to manipulate us like little puppets to show his sovereignty. That would be a total lack of confidence on his part, a lack of faith in himself. He just turns it loose, says, okay, you've got your free will, do with it as you choose, and then I'll deal with what you do later on. <laughs> That's sovereignty. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. See, if we didn't have human desires, we couldn't be enticed into doing wrong things. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. That's what God said. That's what's been happening now. Throughout the millennia of, the human, of human history, that's exactly what has been happening. You and I wonder why is the world in such a sorry condition? I, I love reading these things by atheists where they say there can't be any God because if there was, the world wouldn't be in such a bad mess. <laughs> they never stop and remember that God created a perfect world. He created a paradise and put the first human beings in it, and they messed it up. It wasn't God who messed it up. It was, it's us who messed it up. The world has been suffering from that original sin of Adam and Eve right down to this moment, and it will go on this way until Jesus comes back and sets it all straight. It's not God that messed up the world. It's us, God's, the, the crown jewels of God's creation. We're the ones who messed it up. Yet so many people so blinded by the deceit, by the guile of the devil, they can't see it. They blame all the problems in the world on God. If he's really God, what's this world in such a mess? A guy named Alistair Payne has written a book that I really hope I can get my hands on. It's called The First Chapters of Everything, colon, 
how Genesis 1 through 4 explains everything. And in it, he uses a personal experience to describe what happened there in that Garden of Eden back in those days. He said his parents uh, once uh, were out of their house. They received an alarming phone call to say that the house was on fire. They rushed back to find people there working and putting out the fire. And uh, The boiler, the uh, main gas pipe going into the boiler had, had broken and the boiler had exploded. And the boiler was totally a ruin, just a charred pile of junk, and people were there trying to stop the gas leak before things got worse. The rest of the house was, for all intent and purposes, was intact. Everything was right where it had been when they left. They said, oh, it's not so bad. You know, we didn't suffer much loss. But then they went into their house. Everything they touched had that little gray film of smoke. Every time they breathed, they smelled the smoke. Everything was still there, right where they put it, Hadn't even been moved, but it had been polluted by what happened down in that basement. And Alistair Payne says that's exactly what happened to the human race. All God's blessings are still out there. Many of them have just been ruined by what happened in, in that basement in, in the Garden of Eden way back there at the beginning of time. It's all been polluted, contaminated. No matter how good it is, it's got the stench of, of something wrong about it because it's been ruined Man's gullibility, looking for anything that will allow him to step out of the harness God has put us in and get out and do his own thing. Man wants someone else to follow. It's not part of the human nature to want to follow God until that nature gets converted by Jesus Christ. And, and then sometimes the devil using his guile can still come around and find gullibility in us Christians and lead us astray. You and I need to be aware of this. Gullibility is a constant factor in the world, we must always be aware of the fact that we are gullible human beings. The next thing we're going to look at here is the goodness of God. Eight and nine are the verses. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? This you know, the book of Genesis, the beginning of everything, it all starts right there in those first four chapters. I don't understand why God didn't just say, oh, oh, I made them and they made a mistake. They didn't do what it Let's just destroy them right where they are and start over again. In golfer's terms, Lord, why didn't you take a mulligan and hit another shot? <laughs> why didn't you just wipe them out and create a couple new, and then you could tell them the story of Adam and Eve, maybe they wouldn't make the same mistake. No, he didn't do that. The goodness of God. Notice that Adam and Eve tried to cover up their own sin by covering their nakedness, but they did not go to God. God came to them. That's one of the most awesome pictures in the Bible. It's hard to get past that without stopping and just sitting there and just being in awe. Lord, you could have just squashed them like two little bugs. You didn't have to put up with them. You, you gave them one command and they can't even obey that. Just get rid of them and start over. No. They're created in my image. I'm not going to destroy them. I'm going to help them. So God came seeking them. What a picture of the goodness of God. Oh my. He didn't have to let you and I live in our sin as long as he did. At any point through our life, before we were saved, he could have just wiped us out and got rid of us and all the sin that belongs, that belongs to our life, he could have just eradicated it from the earth, but he didn't. He let us live until one day the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ broke through to our sin hard hearts and we said, Jesus, come in and forgive me. Now we're children of the living God. He came seeking us. The Holy Spirit of God knocking on the door of our hearts saying, let Jesus in. He wants to clean up the mess you've made of your life. And we let him in. We sit here today as children of the living God. What an awesome, awesome picture. In verse 21 of chapter 3, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. We're looking for a cause for the crucifixion, aren't we? Man's efforts can never cover man's failures. The best that man can do will never be good enough in the eyes of God. They did their best. They got the fig leaves, big nice leaves, and they sewed themselves some stuff together to cover their nakedness. 
God said that won't work. God is tell, has been telling the human race throughout his relationship with humanity, your efforts are not good enough. Your filthiness is as righteous rags, Isaiah 64, 6 says. There is none that doeth good. No, not one, we read in Romans chapter 3. We can never do good enough. So God did for Adam and Eve what they could not do for themselves. He took the lives of some innocent animals. He skinned them and he used that skin to cover their sinfulness. We don't know what kind of animals they were. The Bible isn't explicit on that and we don't need to know. We just need to know that blood was shed so that sin could be covered. And right there is the very first picture of what's going to happen on good, that first Good Friday in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. And a totally innocent being was slain. Blood was shed so that our sins could be covered. We need to understand it was not the lapse of mankind that caused the crucifixion. It was the love of God that caused the crucifixion. You and I could never have made Jesus die on the cross. All the sins we ever committed would not have made Jesus die on the cross. It was the love of God that caused Jesus to die. So as you go through this Easter season thinking about the arrest, the beating, the torture, all that stuff he went through, the insults, the spitting on him, the pounding in the face, all this stuff that took place. Later on, two Sundays now, when I just try to describe in graphic detail the damage that was done to his physical body, just remember this. It wasn't my sin that caused that. It was the love of God for me in my sin that caused that. And oh, may it help you appreciate this Easter season maybe differently, better than you ever have in the past. It was the love of God. I get amazed sometimes at how God works in my life as a preacher. Now, I want to tell you something. I lock and load these sermons somewhere on Saturday evening, and I say it's over. I was here the other day as they were moving the library out of that room, the, it's now the crying nursing room over there, and I, I found this little book. It's a, a book of, of 31 meditationals written by John Piper, one of us. We, we Christians who read find him one of our best f favorite authors. It's a 31 little meditation in this little book. I just picked it up and took it home. And uh, yesterday, I picked it up for the first time. I read yesterday's and the day before that. And this morning, before I came to church, I read the one for today. And I said, oh, my goodness, Lord, why didn't you take me there yesterday? Well, I could have put it in my notes. It didn't happen. But there's something here I want to read to you right from this book by John Piper. It's his meditation on Psalm 63. And he says here, would this not be more than all riches and fame and success and health indeed all the world can offer? God himself coming near and making our souls drink from his love until all else fades from view and fear is swallowed up in the unshakable security of everlasting enjoyment at the right hand of God. Do you understand the depth of God's love for you? Wouldn't that be better than anything you could possess here on earth if you just wallowed in the love of God and it just saturated every part of your being? Look to the reason for the crucifixion. Yeah, it was necessary because of our sin, but our sin was not the causative factor. It was the awesome love of God for us in our sin that caused the crucifixion. Now this whole thing about blood, it's spoken of very, very... Uh, Pointedly in Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 18 through 22. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle, all the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood. There is no remission. There are people who have done new editions of the Bible where they've erased all the blood from the book of Hebrews. If you ever get your, get your hands on one of those, if you want to know, is it, is it a good translation, something I should have in my library at home or something I should read, look in Hebrews if you see no mention of blood, Throw it in a bonfire somewhere and get rid of it. It's not worth the paper it's written on. Blood. 
the Lord God, when he came into that garden after there'd only been one sin committed by two people on all the planet, blood had to be shed to cover that sin. And when he gave Moses a law behind which so many people try to hide to avoid having to trust Jesus Christ, even that was sanctified with blood. And you and I are saved today because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which only happened because of God's amazing love for people like you and me. Understand this. The goodness of God is a constant factor in the human experience. Now, we've got three things so far. The, the guile of the devil, it is a constant it never changes. The gullibility of man, it is a constant. It never changes. The goodness of God, hallelujah, it's a constant. It never changes. Now we come to verse 10, and I simply call it this, the guiltiness of humanity. Adam said to God, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Sound like the words of a wimpy coward but you and I can rejoice that Adam said those words because that allowed God to forgive their sins. He admitted the guilt. He admitted the sin. He admitted his fear because of his sin. He knew that with that sin on him, he should not present himself before God. When God came walking, hide yourself, God can't look at you with that sin on your life. the guiltiness of humanity. For the purpose of making this point, I want to differentiate for you between two words, guiltiness and guilt. Guiltiness is a universal, share, universal fact shared by all mankind. Before the righteous eyes of a holy God, we all bear our own guiltiness. Guilt, on the other hand, according to yourdictionary.com, which you can find on your computer, a feeling you've done something wrong or bad or let someone down on the or the state of having broken a law. Guiltiness is inarguable culpability. Guilt is the inescapable consciousness of that culpability. Guiltiness is the state that in which all of us live. Guilt is when we feel that guiltiness and we become ashamed of it. Guilt is more like an emotion. I feel my shame. I know what I've done wrong. I feel guilty because I am guilty. Adam was guilty. He confessed it. Guiltiness of man is a constant factor in the world. All are guilty. The guilt of man, sadly, is not a constant factor. There are some people who live in sin and never, ever feel a touch of guilt. Or so they say. There are people who live in sin with total impunity. They never, ever consider that they're violating God's commands, that they're disgracing the God who created them. They have no feeling of guilt. Those people have no chance of ever entering into the kingdom of God as long as they cannot admit their guilt. As long as they don't feel any sense of culpability for having violated God's laws. A guy named Francis Bufford uh, wrote a book called Unapologetic. It was published just two years ago. It talked about people like you and me gathered here in church this morning. And I think it helps us get the right attitude about why we're here, who we are as we come here. He says, so of all things, Christianity isn't supposed to be about gathering up the good people, the shiny, happy, squeaky clean, and excluding all the bad people, the frightening, the alien, the repulsive, for the very reason, simple reason that there aren't any good people. This goes flat contrary to the predominant image of Christianity existing in prissy, fastidious little enclaves far from life's messier zones and inclined to get all judgmental about those other people. Of course, there are Christians like that. Then he says, the religion certainly can slip into being a club or a cozy affinity group or a wall against the world, but it isn't supposed to be. What it's supposed to be is a league of the guilty. You and I gathered here today are what Spufford would call the league of the guilty. Forgiven because we felt our guilt. We acknowledged our guilt. We came to Jesus Christ in our guilt. Lord, do for me what I can't do for myself. We didn't try to cover our own sins. We turned it over to him and said, Lord, you're the only one who can deal with the mess I've made of my life. And he did the job. Why? 
because God loves us. He doesn't want to destroy us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the love of God that caused the crucifixion. There's a fellow named Josh Whedon, uh, uh, a well-known screenwriter and uh, producer. He brought us movies like Toy Story and The Avengers. And uh, Entertainment Weekly interviewed him uh, not long ago. And they asked him, uh, did he have any hope that the human race is becoming smarter and better? And Josh Whedon said, I think we're actually becoming stupider and more petty. What's going on in this country, many countries, is beyond depressing. It's terrifying. Sometimes I have to remember who I'm talking to. I'll say something about how terrible things are and meaningless. The world's headed toward destruction and war and apocalypse. At one point, my daughter goes, hey, I'm eight years old. She doesn't want to hear that stuff. But I can't believe anybody thinks we're actually going to make it, make it before we destroy the planet. I honestly think it's inevitable. I have no hope. I want to be wrong more than anything. I hate to say it. It's, it's that line from the Lord of the Rings. I give hope to men. I keep none for myself. What was the cause for the crucifixion? A God with a magnanimous heart filled with love for fallen mankind, looking down upon us in pity and compassion, in love and grace and mercy. They have no hope. But I'm not going to give up on hope. I'm going to give hope to them. In the form of my son hanging on a cross in their place, bearing his sins upon his sinlessly perfect body, I will create hope for the human race. Because you see, without Jesus, it's just like the guy in Lord of the Rings said, I give hope to men, I keep none for myself. Oh, you and I can never say that. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we can say there is great hope for the entire human race, for all who will turn to Jesus, acknowledging their guiltiness, Wearing their guilt, tired of their guilt, turning it over to the Lord Jesus so he can forgive it. That was the cause for the crucifixion. God loves us so much. He made a way to pay the sin debt that we could never pay. Our question to ourselves is, have I appropriated unto myself that which Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he hung there all that suffering, all that gory, bloody mess they made of his body as he died taking my sin upon himself. Have I appropriated that? Do I have that in my life? Can I claim that for myself? Because in repentance, I've turned toward God. In faith, I've reached out to Jesus Christ. said, Lord, do for me what I can't do for myself. Yes, the sin of Adam and Eve is passed down to you and me. That was a reason why there had to be a crucifixion. But it wasn't sin that caused it. It was God's love for you and me. Father, there are no ways we can measure your love. There's no way we can ever fully describe it. It goes beyond human comprehension. But the evidence of it, Lord, is all around us. You show us your love in so many ways never greater than when Jesus hung on the cross in our place. Oh, what a demonstration of divine love that was. Lord, help us today to understand the scope of your love, the depth of it, understand what it motivated you to do for us. And Lord, help us, those of us who are already saved, help us to live in some way trying to be worthy of that love, that sacrifice that Jesus made. If there are those among us this morning, Lord, who do not yet know that love in a personal saving way. May they come to repentance this morning. May they bear their own guilt, admit it, and admit they can do nothing about it on their own and trust Jesus. Let him take it out of their life and save them forever and ever. Thank you for your amazing love for such undeserving people such as us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing our invitation song this morning, this is a time when I kind of hope you'll forget about things I've been saying and listen to the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, speaking in your life. He will tell you if there's anything He wants you to do. And as He whispers to you, we want you to step out and come do that. If it's to talk to me about salvation, please come. We'll go out somewhere and have a conversation. I'll tell you how to become saved this morning. If it's about uh, maybe rededicating your life, just come and kneel at the altar and pray. Just talk directly to God. You don't have to talk to me. 
If it's a church membership issue, I'd love to talk with you about that. We think people's church membership ought to be where their body is because that's the only place you can serve at one time, you see. We'd like to talk with you about church membership. So you listen to the voice of God, the Holy Spirit. Do what he tells you to do. We're here to rejoice with you when you obey him. Please stand and sing with us. Do whatever the Lord tells you to do. I want us tonight at five o'clock. The theme is Crazy Shoe Night. Sing this with us. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with in.
Him, let's praise Him, let's praise 